Christie was the classic ambiguous serial killer. He was filthy, but he was also fastidious. Christie was a monster that had been going for years and murdering girls left, right and centre. There was a sexual element in the killing that gave it a ghoulish glamour. In 1953, the police entered number 10 Rillington Place in London. It was simply a house of horrors, the scene of eight horrific murders. The man believed to be responsible for these brutal killings was John Reginald Christie. 60 years on, I want to find out how this decade of destruction went undetected and how Christie was able to frame one of his neighbours, Timothy Evans, for a murder he didn't commit. In the 1940s and 50s, he gained the trust of vulnerable women and exploited that trust to sexually abuse and then kill them, hiding their bodies in his house. How did he get away with it? And why wasn't he brought to justice earlier? John Reginald Christie was born in Halifax in 1899. One of seven children, he was the youngest male amongst a largely female household. And he resented the fact the girls in the family had power over him. It made him crave the opportunity for authority. Someone who knows a lot about John Christie is Edward Marston, an author with a passion for historical crime. Very obedient boy, very bright at school. Uh, he joined the Scouts and he sang in the choir. When he joined the Scouts, they gave him a rather nice uniform and he wore it when he wasn't supposed to. He just loved the idea because it gave him definition. It gave him an authority, it gave him a kind of a, a role to play, if you like. Women played an important role in Christie's life. One of his first teenage sexual experiences is believed to have made a significant impact on the way he viewed the opposite sex. The girl with whom he went was slightly more experienced and he wasn't able to have sex with her. So, of course, she told her friend who told the rest of them and suddenly his nicknames became Can't Do It Christie or Reggie Nodick. And that's very humiliating if you're in a small community. The problems Christie suffered in the lane were to haunt him throughout his life. I want to know if these frustrations played a pivotal role in Christie becoming a serial killer. Professor David Wilson is a leading expert in understanding the criminal mind. Here's the thing, Fred, which I think has quite a big and marked impact on Christie's development as a killer. He had impotence problems, certainly when he's dealing with a woman who can exercise her own power, the power that comes from her gender. And I think that has quite a big pattern on the way that Christie's going to behave later with those women that he kills. After leaving school, Christie worked as a cinema operator and then a postman. When he was 21, he met Ethel Waddington. She was plain and homely. After a short courtship, they married. The marriage appeared to be happy for a while. Um, he admitted later that sex was always very sporadic between the two of them. So there was no possibility of, of children, obviously. Um, he, he then took the job as the postman, which I'd mentioned before, and began to steal postal orders, which meant he went to prison for, for a short period of time, and suddenly this image of uh, Reg Christie began to crumble a little. Christie became addicted to the seedier parts of life. On his release from prison, he separated from his wife, Ethel, and travelled to London. And then for a 10-year period, we have this kind of twilight zone where he lives in the criminal underworld, visiting prostitutes, uh, mixing with low life, having a job here, losing a job there, um, not having any particular home, just sort of drifting and going into prison three or four times. By the beginning of the Second World War, Christie came to the conclusion he wanted respectability. So he persuaded his wife, Ethel, to return to him. The Christies relocated to Notting Hill in London and moved into a small flat in 10 Rivington Place. Here, nobody knew of Christie's criminal past. He set out to establish himself as a respected member of the community. He saw an advertisement in the paper for the police reserve. He applied, um, didn't mention the fact that he had four convictions, of course, and foolishly, they didn't check. 
So Reg Christie, the convicted criminal, is suddenly in uniform as a symbol of, you know, all that's good and the right side of the law. And of course, being a special constable, that gives him further opportunities to meet and engage with people, specifically young women, that he might want to have some power and control over. Indeed, he's so fastidious in his role as a special constable, the neighbours describe him as the Himmler of Rillington Place. Christie's position gave him power over the community, and he exploited it. And having worked with the, uh, the criminal underworld, prostitutes would give him uh, free entertainment, shall we say, if he turned a blind eye to, to, to their soliciting and so on. So from his point of view, it was wonderful. I'm going to meet a man who remembers wartime Britain very well. He's 96-year-old Len Trevelyan, who saw service as an RAF pilot and also as an officer in the Metropolitan Police. He came face to face with Christie. Can you describe to me, Rillington Place, what it was like? It was a little cul-de-sac with a brick wall for, uh, right across the road at the end of uh, 10 Rillington Place. And the houses there were all occupied, multi-tenancies, multi three and four to a, a room. Rillington Place was in a poor neighbourhood. However, it was a perfect location for the now respectable Christie to continue with his seedier pastime. And in that sort of Rillington Place area, I mean, how big a problem was prostitution at that time? Many people had lost their husbands or the girlfriends who'd had um, boyfriends that killed in the war. So there were a lot of women with no men folk behind them. And the only way they could get a living was prostitution. With no contraceptive pill and no legal abortion, many of the women found themselves with unwanted pregnancies. Len Trevelyan believes Christie and his wife Ethel capitalised upon this, carrying out illegal abortions in their kitchen. They had this deck chair in the kitchen down below, and the girls would sit in this deck chair with had strings across the base of it, and so his wife was able to perform the abortion. He had a rubber tube from the, the gas stove and a tin fashioned like a mask at the end, and they used to put the girls out with cold gas. So they were working a little scheme that's working very well. It's Len's belief that the Christie's became well-known amongst ladies in the area for their procedures. But life changed for a while when, in 1943, Ethel went to visit with her sister in Sheffield. With his wife away, Christie became involved with a local prostitute. Ruth Fürst was an Austrian émigré. Um, she came over to this country to train as a nurse, but by the time she meets Christie in 1943, she's by and large selling sexual services to American Air Forcemen. In other words, she's working as a prostitute. With Christie's wife away, Ruth became a regular visitor to his ground floor flat, where he paid for her services. Christie gets a telegram from his wife saying she's coming back from Sheffield and I think he doesn't want to take the chance that Ruth Fürst isn't going to spread rumours about him, isn't going to turn up at 10 Rillington Place, demand to speak to Ethel Christie, Mrs Christie, and tell her exactly what's been happening. And I think it's that telegram that causes Christie to think he'll have to dispose of Ruth Fürst. During their final sexual encounter, Christie strangled Ruth. Years later, he would tell the police, she was completely naked. I tried to put her clothes back on her. She had a leopard skin coat and I wrapped this around her. I took her from the bedroom and put her under the floorboards. Of course, killing someone is the ultimate form of power, the ultimate expression of the control that you have over that particular victim. So clearly this is the beginning of that sexual fetish that he has emerging. Christie's first murder had given him a thrill. He was soon looking for another victim to satisfy his desires. Christie carried on without a care in the world. He'd given up his job as a special constable and was now working at the Ultra Radio Works in Acton. It was there that he met Muriel Eady. Muriel Eady came from a respectable family, uh, spinster in her 30s. They met regularly in the canteen uh, over a meal, 
and she grew to trust him. And she had this problem with Qatar. And she talked about that, and that sort of set his mind rolling. With his wife away, Christie offered to cure Muriel of her affliction using a breathing device. When she visited 10 Rillington Place, he put a mask on her face. It was connected to the gas. That gas will render Muriel Edie unconscious, and I think Christie enjoys having women unconscious because that way he can control them further, as opposed to a living, breathing woman who's going to have her own views about what might be happening in terms of their relationship. With his victim unconscious, Christie had sex with Muriel, and then he produced a rope and strangled her. He had this phrase about, I felt this wonderful sense of excitement and this wonderful sense of, of release, uh, which could only happen, not with his wife, but with people in this situation. Christie had now taken the lives of two young women, Ruth Fewest and Muriel Edie. He buried their bodies in his back garden. Nobody knew they'd been visiting Christie. It meant he was free to continue his murder spree. And it wouldn't take him long to strike again. Christie hid behind an air of respectability, working as a ledger clerk at the post office. It's alleged that he, along with his wife Ethel, also helped out women who found themselves with unwanted pregnancies. In 1948, a couple by the name of Evans moved into the flat above the Christie's. Tim and Beryl Evans were expecting their first child, and they quickly attracted the attention of their sinister neighbour. Here's this young couple, moved from Wales, Timothy Evans is from Wales, moves into London trying to get a job. This is a young man in his mid-twenties, newly married, working as a van driver, and crucially has an IQ reputedly to be around 70. And he's got this wife as well that Christie clearly is interested in because we now know, of course, that Christie's interested sexually in young women that he can have power over. The Evanses had their first baby, Geraldine, but family life wasn't all they'd hoped it would be. The cramped and squalid conditions of Rillington Place weren't ideal to raise a child. The problem came when she conceived a second child and suddenly panic set in. Uh, they were all short of money. He was earning seven pounds a week and could make it up to eight pounds, but then that had to cover the payments on, well, the rental, obviously, the payments on the furniture and all the other things. Unknown to Beryl, John Christie had learned of her situation and was preparing a way to solve Beryl's problem. Beryl is panicking. She wants to have an abortion. First of all, her husband was against it, so she tries to give herself an abortion by taking pills. Inevitably, um, Christy got to hear about it and said, look, I can solve this problem, you know. And Evans went along with the notion that Christy would go up and perform this. In fact, he came down, his wife said, when you go downstairs, tell Christy um, it's all right, which he did, and then he went off to work. Little did Timothy Evans know he was leaving his wife in the hands of a murderer. On his return, Evans was told by Christie that he'd tried to carry out an abortion on Beryl, but tragically, she died during the procedure. When Timothy comes back from work that particular evening, Christie reveals his, your, your wife has died and you're to blame. He said to Evans, well, of course, I go to prison, but, you know, so will you, because you're an accessory. So what we have to do is cover this up. Beryl's body was dumped into an empty room in 10 Rillington Place. Christie told Tim he'd get rid of her body down a manhole outside. Evans was now left looking after his baby and having to explain the disappearance of her mother. With an IQ well below the average of 100, Evans was susceptible to another idea from his neighbour, Christie. So Christie said, I've got a childless couple in East Acton who would take the child on and see that she was properly brought up. And you could go back and see her, you know, eventually. Uh, of course, these people didn't exist, but as far as Evans were concerned, they did. 
the key thing that Christie would be telling Evans is that you have to get out of London. But don't imagine that Timothy Evans is going to behave logically. Timothy Evans was a young man, clearly stressed, clearly doesn't know how to react, and is listening to somebody who he thinks is looking out for his best interests, so he simply does as he's told. With his beloved wife dead, it's believed Evans made the decision to leave his child in the care of Christie. He then fled to Wales to stay with relatives. Both Beryl and Tim's family started to ask questions about his wife and child's whereabouts. On the 30th of November, unable to maintain the pretense any longer and racked with guilt, Tim went to the police station in Merthyr Tydfil. So he was cautioned and he made the first of the two statements in Merthyr Tydfil. The first said, my wife died in an abortion and I disposed of her down the manhole outside. The police visited Rillington Place, searched the manhole and found nothing. If they'd looked elsewhere, they might have found the hidden bodies of Christie's victims. At this point, Evans implicated Christie, claiming he'd played a part in her death. In his statement to the police, he said, I asked him how long she'd been dead. He said since three o'clock. Then he told me my wife's stomach had been septic poisoned. The police paid another visit to Rillington Place and this time knocked on the door of John Christie. The Christies presented a united front, denying any wrongdoing. The word of this respectable middle-aged couple appeared to be worth more than that of working-class Evans. But, of course, you've got a young man who's disappeared out of London and then reports his wife as being murdered. He tells the police she's going to be found in a particular drain. That's a lie, so the police don't have any reason to believe Timothy Evans. Christie told the police that his neighbour, Evans, was an abusive alcoholic. The police quickly established that Beryl and the baby were missing and carried out a full-scale search of Rillington Place. Behind a wood pile in the wash house, they uncovered the remains of Tim's wife, Beryl, and, most shockingly, that of baby Geraldine. They'd both been strangled. But the suspicion of guilt didn't fall upon Christie. He was taken to see the, the, the bodies at the mortuary, um, but he was shocked by the fact that his daughter was dead because he'd come back firmly believing that Geraldine was still alive. And he came up with the story about, you know, where they've gone to people in, in East Acton. After a lengthy interrogation at Notting Hill Police Station, the easily led Evans changed his story once again. He confessed to the murders of his wife and child. Briefly explain to me, if you can, how the system of statements uh, worked at that time. Uh, a CID officer were trained. To take it. They had to go on a course and learn how to take statements. And the statements are taken from prisoners under caution. And they write down his answers. Uh, in those days, it was no typewriting or recordings. They had to write out his statements and get him to sign it and acknowledge it. The statements given in this case were crucial. Evans had difficulty reading and writing, so his account was dictated to the police. I'm going to meet Dr. John Olson, one of the leading experts in forensic linguistics, who believes a full stop is just as revealing as a bloodstained knife. If you think of language as being something which is very formal at one end, and very informal at the other. So at the higher end of this, we would get what is called police register, and at the other end, we would get what we would call very colloquial language. What we find in the Evans statements is a complete mix. But in the Merthyr Tidville statements, um, we don't find a great deal of mixture of register. It is, mo it is fairly faithful to the way that, uh, that Evans probably would have spoken. What about when we get to the statements made to the police at Notting Hill Police Station? I think we have a completely different situation. Can you illustrate that? Yes. We can see that I've put a blue rectangle around the first sentence there where it says she was incurring one debt after another. He wouldn't have said this is incurring. <clears throat> absolutely not. I mean, this is very high register language. Yes. And here we have 
I would think, a number of examples of police type language. We have squandering. I accused her of squandering the money. Not a word Evans would ever have used. I, I don't think so. No. I don't think so. It's a little bit like incurring. Yeah. It's kind of, it doesn't really belong there, I feel. And then that started a terrific argument in my house. But I can't see, uh, you know, a very ordinary chap from the valleys who's grown up in London, very little education, using a phrase like terrific argument. You know, we had a bloody row, is probably what he would have said. Do you suppose Evans actually understood fully what he was alleged to have signed and said? No, not at all. On the 11th of January, 1950, Timothy Evans went on trial at the Old Bailey, charged with the murder of his daughter, Geraldine. By now, he'd retracted his earlier statements of guilt and professed that Christie was guilty of the murders. The trial would bring him face to face with his neighbor. When he got to the trial, of course, he pleaded not guilty. Um, was horrified at the idea that, that they thought he'd killed his, his daughter. But by this stage, the evidence against him, as presented, was overwhelming. Um, you know, here was a man, lived with a woman, needed to get rid of the child, killed her in a row, it was said. Uh, the two Christies swore that they'd heard a thud in the room above. And here was a man who'd been a policeman, who knew how to talk to policemen, who'd been in court a number of times, knew, who knew the ropes. So Christie sold him down the well, river. Christie sold him down the river and, of course, was the chief witness. The trial lasted three days and after just 40 minutes of deliberation, the jury found Evans guilty of murder. He was sentenced to death. Christie's evidence had been instrumental in convicting the trusting young man. The bodies of the two other women Christie had previously killed remained undiscovered. He was still free from suspicion. As the Christies left court, Evans's mother shouted at him, murderer, murderer. Ethel, Christie's wife, leapt to his defense. Don't you dare call my husband a murderer, she said. He's a good man. While Christie went off on holiday to Sheffield, Evans appealed to the Home Secretary, Mr. Tudor Ede, but was unsuccessful. Timothy John Evans was hanged on March the 9th, 1950, at Pentonville Prison. He protested his innocence to the end, but it did no good. In the eyes of the law, the case was closed. They had their man, or so they thought. Life in 10 Rillington Place had changed since the death of Beryl and Geraldine Evans. A new landlord had filled the empty flats. Christie didn't want the new residents to discover the two bodies of Ruth Hewist and Muriel Eady he disposed of on the premises. Faced with increased comings and goings from their neighbours, tensions between Ethel and John Christie began to rise. Well, here you've got Christie after Evans has hanged, as he must have felt he's got away with it again. Um, he must have felt powerful again. I think, interestingly, that Ethel, Christie's wife, exercises some kind of informal control over Christie's behaviour, but her relationship with Christie is breaking down. So the two of them living close together began to argue much more. She was very depressed. She was on tablets. Um, and there came a point, I think, when she must have known rather more than she wanted to, began to put two and two together. You know, there must have been seeds of doubt in her mind. And I think when they were close together and nothing else to do but be close together, Ethel began to challenge him. Nobody can really be sure why, but on the 14th of December, 1952, Christie decided to turn his attention to Ethel. He strangled his wife in their bed with a stocking. Unlike his previous murders, he didn't take advantage of her sexually. His wife of 32 years had now become just another victim. Christie wrapped her body in a blanket and placed it under the floorboards. The key thing for me is where do the bodies go to? Because he's already disposed of the bodies of um, two murder victims in the garden, but he chooses to bury Ethel by prizing up the floorboards in the ground floor flat of Rillington Place and leaving her uh, under the floorboard. So every day that he's walking back and forth across 
his uh, landing. He's walking on his wife. This is again a way of demonstrating in a very symbolic way the control that he must have had over her. Just days after the murder, a theft occurred in another of the flats in 10 Rillington Place. Policeman Len Trevelyan paid Christie a visit and was invited in to the killer's home. When I went up to, to tell Christie about this arrest that I'd made in his house afterwards, I interviewed him in his front room. And in conversation, I said to him, what a terrible stink you've got in this house, Christy. Can't you do something about it? He said, well, it's all these coloured people and their strange cooking. It makes um, a terrible smell. And um, I thought, well, that doesn't fit in with this. And I didn't realise then that I was standing over the remains of his wife under the floorboards where I was standing. When I spoke to him afterwards, in, uh, you know, when he was being arrested and when I was chatting to him in his cell, um, and... Uh, he said, when I said your, your wife's body was found under the floor, he said, yes. He said, now you, perhaps you realise what that smell was that you were talking about when you came up to tell me about the, the prisoner. In later years, Len Trevelyan believed he learned the motives behind the murder and how close Christie had become to being caught. Did Christie explain to you why? Um, I, I said to him, uh, what, what happened after the girls were operated on? He said, well, we used to put them into the front room to recover. And this was his downfall. He said, well, when she found me interfering with the girls, she threatened to uh, expose me and tell the police about me. He said, and, and I, I couldn't, and we struggled, and I had an argument with her, and, and um, eventually I strangled her in, in, the, in the struggle. Christie explained his wife's disappearance by telling people she'd gone to visit her sick sister in Birmingham. With an empty house, he was now free to indulge his deadly desires and went looking for new victims. Rita Nelson worked at a local tea shop and found herself with an unwanted pregnancy. She turned to Christie for a solution. He claimed that she met him outside a pub and pursued him and came back. I firmly believe she came back because he said he could give her an abortion. And part of the abortion, of course, would have been the famous gassing treatment that he had where he would offer her something which appeared to be curative and, in fact, was gas which would have rendered her unable to defend herself in, in the, the chair. And then he would have had his way with her. Rita had gone to Christie for help, yet she became the sixth victim to be murdered at 10 Rillington Place. The serial killer was out of control. Then he puts her into an alcove in the kitchen, just had a little sort of cupboard on the front, bunged her in there. Shortly afterwards, there's another lady who comes along, Kathleen Maloney, someone he knows with whom he's had intercourse before. And again, he takes her back. Uh, she was drunk, so there was no possibility of, of, you know, too much resistance. And again, strangling, intercourse. And he rather forgot about it. He left her in this, the deck chair all night, then woke up and found her there. And then shoved her into the alcove, which wasn't very large, so he put her on her back with her legs in the air. So he got two there with his wife under the floorboards. I think Ethel exercised some informal control over her husband's behaviour, and with Ethel out of the way, hidden under the floorboards, the numbers of victims increase and the gap between victims narrows. Now, crucially, Fred, remember this kind of idea that the serial killer at the end of a a killing cycle, simply inhabits, operates in a world that makes sense to that killer rather than makes sense in any cognitive way that you and I might recognise. Christie was murdering vulnerable women he knew wouldn't be missed. Hectorina McLennan was in need of somewhere to live. Christie heard about her plight and offered her his flat, but she wasn't alone. Hectorina had a boyfriend called Alex Baker, who moved in with her. Christie wasn't impressed, but still let them stay. After three days, they decided to leave. Christie asked her to pay him one final visit before she moved on. It would be her fatal mistake. He strangled 26-year-old Hectorina before taking advantage of her. 
Christie then took her body to the alcove, placing it alongside his previous two victims. Of course, Baker came expecting to find her there, and Christie said she never turned up. Uh, let's, let's search the house. So they searched the whole house for her, and she wasn't there. Christie made him a cup of tea to calm him down. Uh, they searched the streets in a search that Christie knew was totally futile. And for the next few days, he went and saw Baker, kept saying, is there any news, you know, what the hell has happened to her? But all the time, he knew exactly what had happened to her. Behind closed doors, Christie was becoming nervous. The bodies of his victims were literally beginning to stack up. Christie took the decision he needed to move away from the scene of his crimes. But with no money, he decided to sublet the flat. Christie then met two people called the Reilly, husband and wife, and persuaded them that he was the landlord and that they could move in, and he took the rent off them for quite a, t you know, I think something like three, three or four weeks in advance. Christie then packed up everything that he thought was important and off he went. Christie vanished leaving behind the house that had bore witness to eight murders and still contained six of the bodies. So by the end of a killing spree, a serial killer is psychologically disintegrating. He's no longer thinking in any way that you and I could recognize as logical. Some people argue that they disintegrate because they want to be caught, because they're basically saying, stop me. Whereas I tend to think, given some of the people I've worked with, it's not so much that, that they want to be caught, it's because they're so filled with power. Because frankly, if you've got a way with propping up a trellis in your garden with the bone of Muriel Edie and nobody's ever noticed that, if you've been putting your wife under the floorboards and nobody's ever noticed that the smell is overpowering, of course you're going to think you can get away with anything. On the 24th of March, 1953, Beresford Brown, a new tenant of number 10, was fixing a bracket to the kitchen wall. He noticed wallpaper covering an alcove. On ripping the covering off, he was the first to see the true horror Christie had left behind. Once again, the police were called to 10 Rillington Place. This time, they left no stone unturned. They found three bodies in the alcove. Under the floorboards, they found Christie's wife, Ethel. And in the garden, they unearthed more remains. Bone after bone was retrieved, forming the skeletons of Ruth Fewest and Muriel Eady. By March 1953, 10 Rillington Place had turned into a real house of horrors. The discovery of six bodies started the hunt for a ruthless killer, a killer who'd spent a decade living as a real life, Jekyll and Hyde. Just how had this serial killer got away with murder? By 1953, Christie was on the run. The police launched one of Britain's biggest ever manhunts, having uncovered a scene of devastation at his flat. They discovered the bodies of six women hidden at 10 Rillington Place. Several of them had never been declared missing, and Christie had covered the murder of his wife by telling people she was away visiting relatives. He got money from his wife's uh, bank account, just over ten pounds, and clearly he was on the run and he was crumbling. He went straight to a Routon house, which is a place for down and outs, where you slept in a huge room with all the beds, cheek by jowl with each other, made no attempt to disguise his, his identity and gave his insurance card and so on, and then just sort of drifted, wandered through London. How he slept, at, we don't know. On the 31st of March, a man was stopped by police on the embankment near Putney Bridge. He called himself John Waddington. On further inspection, it was obvious that this man was in fact the sadistic killer they were looking for. It was Christie. He was taken to Putney Police Station and accused of murdering his wife, Ethel. Christie claimed it was a mercy killing He'd awoken and discovered her convulsing, unable to breathe. He then went on to describe the other killings as acts of self-defense or accidents. He had a capacity for deliberately forgetting things, of putting unpleasant things in a part of his mind that he closed the door on, as it were. 
So he always showed himself in a good light. He's either the victim of these women when they come back, they attack him, he has to fight them off, and somehow, I don't know how, they fall dead at my feet. Now, he doesn't mention the gasoline, and he doesn't mention the, uh, the intercourse that he had with them. He's either a mercy killer with his wife, um, or in the case of Bedell Evans, he's there to help her commit suicide, which again, you know, could be seen in, in a certain light. Christie was aware that if he was tried and found guilty of the murders, he'd be executed. By distancing himself from them and portraying himself as insane, he'd have an opportunity to escape the gallows. Forensic linguist John Olson has examined the statements Christie made and thinks they reveal how cunning he was. So he was a, he was a good user of language and he was articulate. And in my experience, when the police are dealing with a very articulate, uh, clearly spoken person, then they are not going to, to alter that language in any way. Although it was all about him, he had this way of kind of making himself invisible in the text. Can you show, can you give me an I example? I certainly can. Uh, here he says, the statement I made on the 5th June 1953 is true so far as I remember what happened, except that a square scarf was not used when the gas was inhaled. If I can just point out what's actually happening there, when he says a square scarf was not used, he's actually saying, I didn't use a scarf to kill this woman, to put over her head so that she couldn't get any air. But he's phrasing it in this very impersonal way, as though it's almost somebody else who's doing the action. He's sort of absenting he's, himself he's away He's definitely from it. absenting himself. Yes. Ordinarily, you'd look at that and think, did the police write that? Well, no, absolutely not. That is, that is the way that he, uh, if you look th throughout his statements and throughout his testimony, he always absents himself. Away from the eyes and ears of his interrogators, Christie had a different story that he would tell to one of his guards, Len Trevelyan. I was called upon to sit in with him and chat to him, and he recognised me as being the person who had spoken to him some time before, you know, when I went to his house. <clears throat> so he was, he was willing to chat. He was pleased to get it off his chest. And I, uh, I did say to all these last three girls, they were pregnant. He said, well, he said, I couldn't tell them that my wife was not there to do the abortion. He said, so uh, I had to keep them quiet. And if they were dead, they couldn't talk about it. He said, one, and then I hoped there would be no more. But then in due course, there were two others came. He said, and I dealt with them the same way. He said, but I'm afraid each one of them I did um, indulge in sexual intercourse with them when they were dead. Christie was charged with the murder of four women. The law meant he could only be tried for one. The prosecution decided the strongest case was for the murder of his wife, Ethel. Once he got to prison, his attitude trained. I mean, if you, if you watch him in photographs uh, when he was arrested, he's doing things like this. But when he gets to prison, suddenly he becomes, well, not exactly a glamour boy, but he's a bit of a special case. You know, he's been involved not just in murders, but there is sex involved, which is something very unusual at, at, at that stage. Most serial killers love inserting themselves into the heart of the story. It gives them that sense of power, of celebrity, that often they've desired in the past but can't gain in any legitimate way. And so, of course, Christie would be like that. He would follow the papers, he would enjoy the attention. On the 22nd of June, 1953, it was standing room only in court number one at the Old Bailey. Journalists and the public filled the gallery, keen to see the man whose crimes had shocked Britain. Christie was tried for the murder of his wife, Ethel, in a trial that lasted only four days. When asked if he'd committed more murders than were known about, he replied, I can't say exactly. I might have done. Christie's testimony would be crucial in determining whether he was fully responsible for the murders or was insane. While giving evidence, he showed no emotion about the murders of his last three victims. It was only when talking about his wife's murder that he burst into tears. The psychiatrist who supported that defence, uh, was a man called Hobson, gave a very convincing account, but the other two psychiatrists who spoke to him at great length both said he had a hysterical personality 
but that doesn't mean to say that he was insane. He knew exactly what he was doing, and there's calculation involved at every stage of the game. This man planned these things. Christie also admitted to murdering fellow Rillington Place resident Beryl Evans. But there was one murder he refused to take responsibility for, the crime that Timothy Evans had hanged for. That was the Evans's baby, Geraldine. Well, he never admitted to Geraldine's death. Uh, he said, why should I kill a small child like that? Well, he knew that it would destroy the image of himself that he was trying to build up. This man who was involved in one killing, which we, could be a mercy killing, uh, and three in which he was basically defending himself. Also, he knew that he, if he went into uh, prison as a child killer, he would be viewed very differently than as somebody who went in as a sex killer. Because if you kill a child, a lot of the prisoners have families with small children. And he's more likely to be attacked and beaten up. In his summing up, Justice Finnemore said that just because a man acted like a monster, it did not mean he was insane. After just one hour and 20 minutes of deliberating, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Christie was sentenced to death by hanging for the murder of his wife. Whilst awaiting his fate at Pentonville Prison, Christie received a letter from Timothy Evans's mother. In it, she begged Christie to admit to killing the baby Geraldine that her son had been hanged for. Christie not only refused, but he also retracted his statement that had said he'd killed Beryl Evans. Why do serial killers in the main not confess to all the killings they've committed? Serial killers that I've worked with never want to speak about those things. I think partly because it's the ultimate form of control. Often they've been seeking power and control in creating victims. That power and control is thus taken away from them after they've been arrested. So how do they then regain that sense of power and control? And what they do is they refuse to talk. They refuse to discuss anything whatsoever about the crime. It's the ultimate form of power and control they can exercise even after conviction. On the 15th of July, 1953, John Reginald Christie was hanged at Pentonville Prison. But even after his death, his crimes and confessions left questions unanswered. Christie's admission to murdering Beryl Evans during his trial led to several inquiries. In 1966, Timothy Evans received a posthumous royal pardon, but attempts to formally quash his conviction have failed. The Judicial Review in 2004 described Timothy Evans's fate as an historic and unique injustice. Evans had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time and had inadvertently moved into a murderer's lair. 10 Rellington Place has now been flattened and erased from the London map, but the atrocities that John Christie committed in the House of Horrors will never, ever be forgotten. Thought it was the perfect crime, but the evidence told a different story. Join me to explore the gruesome truth of the acid bath murderer in another chapter of my murder casebook next. <laughs>